a little over a century ago, uh, in the summer of 1913, a reunion was held in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to mark the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And the gathering lasted three days, and thousands of northern and southern survivors bivouacked in the old battlefield swapping stories and, and looking up comrades. The climax of the gathering was a reenactment of Pickett's Charge. Thousands of spectators gathered to watch as Union veterans took their positions on Cemetery Ridge and waited as their old adversaries emerged from the, the woods on Seminary Ridge and started forward toward them again across the long, flat fields. We could say, see, one observer wrote, not rifles and bayonets, but canes and crutches. We soon could distinguish the more agile ones aiding those less able to maintain their places in the ranks. As they neared the northern line, they broke into one final defiant rebel yell. And here a most unexpected thing occurred, writes one reporter. At that sound, after a half a century of silence, a moan, a sigh, a gigantic gasp arose from the Union men on Cemetery Ridge. It was then that the Yankees, seemingly unable to restrain themselves any longer, burst from behind the stone wall and flung themselves upon their former enemies only not in mortal combat, but in embrace. There on the field of battle, the blue and the gray met, hugged, shook hands, laughed and cried, and reunited in brotherly love and affection. It seems they just didn't want to fight the battle anymore. They wanted peace, and they made it happen. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We live in such Tremendously violent times, particularly with the news these days, filled with stories of new adversaries committing atrocities. Is there anything we can actually do to, to, to change any of this? Being peacemakers, this is something of what I want to talk about this morning. Today we pick up our overview of the Old Testament with a character which we closed our discussion last week, namely Elisha. Elisha was another of the great prophets who ministered in Israel during the time of the divided kingdom, roughly the uh, 9th century BC. Uh, he was a bold, spirit-filled, compassionate individual who performed many great miracles. But particularly, he was known for his focus on the very real, uh, down-to-earth, day-to-day struggles of the people. Thus, he is sometimes referred to as the working man's prophet. He didn't deal in abstracts, he dealt with realities. And our scene today, today being one which kind of encapsulates something of this, something of his character. The setting is this. The people of Israel are at war with the people of Aram, the Arameans, or what is modern-day uh, Syrians. The king of Aram is particularly frustrated because his war plans against Israel keep getting defeated due to Elisha's very wise counsel of the king of Israel. So the king of Aram has sent his army to the town of Dothan to capture and to kill Elisha. But at Elisha's request, God has struck the Arameans blind, and this has enabled Elisha to lead them deep into Israelite territory, specifically to Samaria. And this is where we pick up the story in our text today. Having led them to Samaria, Elisha has God restore their sight. And with that, the Arameans open their eyes and they find themselves now completely surrounded by the Israelite army. The king of Israel eagerly inquires of Elisha, what do you want me to do, kill them? It's like Israel has been handed a gift, their worst enemy, on a silver platter. You know? Understand, as far as the Israelites are concerned, the only kind of good Aramean is a dead Aramean. But much to everyone's surprise, Elisha says, no, don't kill them. Feed them. A most unexpected command, and the king of Israel obeys. He provides a feast for the Arameans, and as the scene closes, we get this one simple line. So he prepared for them a great feast, and after they ate and drank, he sent them on their way, and they went to their master. And the Arameans no longer came raiding into the land of Israel. You get that? Elisha worked peace between these two most hated enemies. They no longer came raiding. You know, it could be argued that this is the greatest miracle of his entire ministry. As mentioned, Elisha worked all kinds of wonders. He even raised a dead child back, from, 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 back to life from death. But working peace between Israelis and Syrians, that tops them all. Now, is this peace for all time? Obviously not. As we even see takes place in the text, new players continually emerge. It's the nature of human life. As long as you have at least two people, you have the potential for conflict. Peacemaking is not a once-for-all time, but an everyday, always task. And it's important to remember that. But what Elisha demonstrates for us here is that it is possible, and that's the point, 
In our very broken, warring world, it's often very difficult not to feel entirely hopeless. We long for peace, but can anything be done? Well, our text today is meant to inspire us, to show us the change, that peace can happen, and this is what I like to consider. A few thoughts on what we can do to promote peace, to contribute something that helps to heal our broken world. Four thoughts on becoming peacemakers, the children of God. Thought number one, what I do matters. To begin with, as mentioned, in working peace between these two nations, Elisha essentially accomplishes his greatest miracle of his life, and notice how this miracle comes about. Does Elisha say a few magic words, wave his hands, and God works some supernatural wonder? No. The Israelites simply served the Arameans lunch. Elisha sees his enemies as human beings, and he treats them as such. They share a meal, a very normal, very natural, very human thing, and it works wonders. And in thinking about this, I can't help but wonder how the Israelites felt as they served their enemy. Were they fearful? Were they angry? Did they do it willingly or grudgingly? Well, whatever, they did it. Something so simple, so doable, and it changed the world. And it, is always, it was always right within their own very human hands. This is what they discovered. And this is the first point here. That peace begins by recognizing that changing the world is right within our hands today. The things we do, simple things, very easily accomplished things, can work miracles. That we have that kind of power in our hands always. You know, I believe that one of the worst things that's happened to the church in the modern era is that we've lost any sense of our power in Christ. Most Christians these days don't believe that they have the power to work miracles. They don't believe that they can really change the world. This loss being most tragic within our own denomination, a branch of the body of Christ that was founded upon the principle of social action, of transforming the world. The motto of the first century of American Methodists, to spread scriptural holiness across the land. Their goal was to change the world. Nowadays, we Methodists don't tend to see ourselves as powerful in Christ. We don't tend to believe we can work wonders. It's like I'm, I'm reminded of the old joke about the Methodist preacher and his wife who, who decide to get a new dog. Ever mindful of their congregation, they knew the dog also needed to be a Methodist, right? So they visited kennel after kennel and explained their needs, and finally they found a kennel owner who assured them that he had exactly the dog that they wanted. The owner brought the dog to the pastor and his wife. Fetch the Bible, the owner commanded. And the dog bounded to the bookshelf, looked through the books, located the Bible, and brought it to the owner. Now find Psalm 23, he ordered. The dog dropped the Bible to the floor and showing marvelous dexterity with his paws. He leaped through, found the correct passage and pointed to it with his paw. The pastor and his wife were impressed and, and they purchased the dog. That evening, a group of church members came to visit and the pastor and his wife began to show off the dog, having him locate various Bible verses. The visitors were quite impressed. And then one man asked, well, this is all great, but can he do regular dog tricks too? I don't know, the pastor replied, I haven't tried that. So with that, the pastor looked at the dog and said, heal. And immediately the dog jumped up on a chair, placed one paw on the pastor's forehead, and began to howl. <laughs> In disgust, the pastor looked at his wife and said, oh great, he's not a Methodist, he's a Pentecostal. <laughs> We Methodists don't tend to think we can have we healing miracles anymore. Well, if we are in Christ, we can. And this is the first thing we need to get into our minds in the work of peace. That my life, my life matters. I may only be able to do some very seemingly tiny thing, but that tiny thing can affect the whole world, and I need to do it. You remember, or have you ever even heard of Samantha Reed Smith? In December 1982, when she was only 10 years old, Samantha Reed Smith wrote a letter to the newly appointed Soviet president, Yuri Andropov, asking in no uncertain terms if he was going to lead a nuclear war against the United States of America if his nation planned to kill us. News on the television in those days was filled with lots of talk of possible nuclear war. And with this in mind, the, the young Manchester, Maine native, she undertook the task of directly contacting the president of the USSR. And President Andropov replied to her letter, inviting Samantha and her parents to visit his country the next summer. And soon after this, the Soviet Union opened talks with the U.S. Now, obviously, there are all sorts of other forces at work here. However, many still argue that her very direct words forced a public discussion that helped end the Cold War. All from just the letter of one 10-year-old girl. In the work of peace, thought number one, what I do matters. Thought number two, peace begins in my heart. 
Many centuries ago, St. Francis of Assisi penned the following prayer to die in his life. He wrote, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Francis sought to be an instrument of God's peace. Notice how he sought this. Not in seeking to change anybody else, but by asking God to, to work on him, to change him, to drive out anything within him that was not of God's love. For Francis, the work of world peace began as a very deeply personal thing. And this is our second point here. Returning to the text. Having discovered their enemies being delivered into their midst, the king of Israel eagerly inquires, you know, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha replies, no. Did you capture with your sword and your bow those whom you now want to kill? Notice the point to the king. You had nothing to do with this, essentially, Elisha is saying. It wasn't even about you. They came to kill me. You are so programmed to hate that you can't even think straight. I am the one who was in danger. I am the one who has been wrong. I am the one with the right to hate. But I am choosing otherwise. And that is the path you're going to take. Have you got it? This healing between nations begins in the heart of one person, a very deeply personal thing, in which despite all the forces that say otherwise, he is choosing to refuse to allow any absence of love for anyone else to exist within his heart. That's the second lesson for us here. To be instruments of God's peace, we have to seek personal peace. Without this, we are useless to God. We cannot work peace. We are effectively outside the body of Christ because Christ is pure love. We have to consciously, intentionally, vigilantly drive out any places in our lives where hatred exists. Maybe it's between us and another person, some grudge we hold, some wrong we won't forgive. Or maybe it's a whole group that we condemn based on color, creed, nationality, orientation, whatever. Understand, any, even the tiniest speck of hate is a cancer, and if left alone, it will metastasize and it will destroy. World peace is secondly a deeply personal thing. You want to change the world? Get your heart right. You know, sociologists note that one of the defining characteristics of our modern, our modern culture is the acceptance, and even almost the outright glorification, of anger and hatred. In the literary world nowadays, there's actually a whole very popular branch of writing known as wrath lit that consists of nothing more than certain well-known individuals their published rants on various topics. This culture of hatred being most noticeable, of course, within the political realm, where as, uh, as author Peter Wood in his book, A Bee in the Mouth, writes, for the first time in our political history, declaring absolute hatred for one's opponent has become a sign not of sad excess, but of good character. Hatred. For our nation, hatred, a sign of good character. Do you believe that? Let us not forget the words of a Christian many centuries ago who said, The surest sign that you are furthest from God, indeed that you have created God in your own image, is that your God hates everyone that you do. God is love and can only fully be known where all hate is driven out. In the work of peace, thought number two, peace begins in my heart. Which leads us into thought number three, somebody has to do better. A noted scholar writes, to triumph fully, evil needs two victories, not one. The first victory happens when an evil deed is perpetrated. The second victory is when evil is returned. After the first victory, evil would die if the second victory did not infuse it with new life. To defeat evil, the good must refuse the rules of engagement that evil is proposing. Basically, to work peace, we have to do better than evil. We have to rise to a higher standard. This is the key theme that drives our whole text today. The king of Israel is ready to do what has always been done, to return to the Arameans in time for what they have sought to do to the Israelites. But Elisha essentially says, no, we're not going to operate on those terms. We're going to set our own terms. Specifically, we're going to do what's right. We're going to enact the kingdom of God, enact how things should be, no matter what comes of it today. A course of action which, as we see, leads to peace. Not returning evil for evil, but answering evil with good. It's the third great challenge for us here. To work peace, we must be willing to set a higher standard for ourselves than any of the evil around us. And we must refuse to return wrong in any kind, no matter how tempting and seemingly logical. Somebody has got to do better. As Christians in 2014, as Americans post 9-11 in the so-called war on terror, how are we doing? 
in Patriot Act, Guantanamo Bay and Predator Drone, how are we doing? Understand this is the endless struggle of democracy, particularly in times of national threat and constant temptation in the name of security to let go of some of the principles that founded our nation. How are we doing? Are we consistently who we really want to be? In everything, do we truly honor all those who have died for our country and the principles for which they gave the last full measure of devotion? Unless we answer too quickly, lest we justify ourselves too confidently saying desperate times call for desperate measures. Let us not forget these words of Benjamin Franklin, who said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Yes, as we see in life and own ministry and as we know in our own age, evil must be opposed, right must be defended, violence must be met with strength, and wrongdoers must be brought to justice. But in so doing, we must never forget that true justice, true peace only comes about when somebody resolves to do better, to rise to a higher standard. We as Christians are called to be the voice and the vote, the protest and the prayer, the demonstration and the demand for that higher standard. In our deeply broken world today, where, where is the voice of the church? Let's face it, the silence is deafening. It seems that today the only time Christians are heard from is when they are pointing at the sins of somebody else or protesting what they see as the threats to their own rights, never when the rights of others are in jeopardy. Our nation was founded upon the highest, most noble ideas, and those ideas are either for all people, in all times and all places, or they are for no one. Consider our own history. We had to fight a bloody civil war among ourselves, brother against brother, because as the words, with liberty and justice for all, were being penned, some were already deciding the exemptions to all. In the book, a knock at midnight, Dr. Martin Luther King, he offers the following reflection, he wrote. My brother and I were driving one evening to Chattanooga, Tennessee from Atlanta. He was driving the car, and for some reason the drivers were very discourteous that night. They didn't dim their lights. Hardly any driver that passed by dimmed his lights. And I remember very vividly my brother looked over at me and in a tone of anger he said, I know what I'm going to do. The next car that comes along refuses to dim the lights, I'm going to refuse to dim mine. I'm just going to pour them on with all their power. And I looked at him right quick, and I said, oh no, don't do that. There'd be too much light on this, this highway, and it will end up in mutual destruction for all. Somebody's got to have a sense, some sense on this highway. Somebody must have sense to dim the lights, and that is the trouble, isn't it? And as all the civilizations of the world move up the highway of history, so many civilizations, having looked at other civilizations that refuse to dim their lights, have decided to refuse to dim theirs, and thus they have found themselves in the jump heap of destruction. Somewhere, somebody must have some sense. Somebody must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of evil in the universe and do otherwise. In the work of peace, thought number three, somebody has to do better. Which leads us to the final thought number four, entry into the lives of others. This morning, as we think about being peacemakers, have you ever thought of, about the simple act of passing the peace that we do every Sunday morning and its true significance? One author writes, the story has been told of a church in the Pacific North, Northwest that participates in the sharing of the peace during worship. When they share the peace, they are enthusiastic. They turn and embrace one another. Newcomers are warmly welcomed. Nobody in this church, nobody in this church thought much about the weekly ritual until the pastor received a letter from a man who had recently joined the congregation. This man was a promising young lawyer from a prestigious downtown law firm, and he drafted a brief but pointed letter to the firm's, on the firm's letterhead. I am writing to complain about the congregational ritual known as passing the peace, he wrote. I disagree with it personally and professionally, and I am prepared to take legal action against the church to cause this practice to cease. When the pastor phoned the lawyer about the letter, he asked the man why he was so disturbed. And the lawyer said, the passing of the peace is an invasion of my privacy. The pastor's response to the lawyer was right on target. He said, like it or not, when you joined the church, you gave up some of your privacy. For we believe in the risen Lord who will never leave us alone. And then he added, you never know when Jesus Christ will intrude on us with a call to peace. To be a Christian means to be a person who is by definition called into the lives of others. And this is why where the Prince of Peace truly shows up when we enter into community. Simply put, in the end, Elisha works peace not by keeping himself and his people outside of the Arameans forever, you know, condemning them and executing them, 
but by entering into their lives and seeking to understand them be part of their existence, to do something, whatever you can, to connect with them. And this is the final lesson for us all here. To become peacemakers, we need to resolve to enter into the lives of others, most especially those we're most separated from. Find some way to enter in and engage them in work life, not death, community, not division. Basically, the final point here is, instead of just thinking about, and talking about, and worrying about, and complaining about our world, to actually do something about it. Particularly, each of us to do something that asks of us to connect with someone across the world that we are presently separated from. For instance, maybe this, just, maybe this means you know, just going to the library and taking out a book about the Muslim faith and learning about it so that we really understand what, what's going on. Or maybe it means whenever someone makes some hurtful, hateful remark, being the one who stands up to oppose it. Or maybe we could just research ways to help people in need in those foreign war-filled places, our own denomination website, UMC.org has plenty of resources. And then looking at these and giving to these causes so as to start to build a bridge of caring that will undermine the forces of hatred. <laughs> the final question to be asked in the work of peace, what can I give of myself to begin to change that relationship? In closing, one final true story. In December 1943, German fighter pilot Franz Stigler was in pursuit of American bomber pilot Charlie Brown, so that's her name, Charlie Brown's B-17, looking to shoot it down. And if he did, Sigler would earn, uh, earn him the Knight's Cross, the highest honor for a German soldier. But as he approached the plane, Sigler saw that it had no tail gun blinking, no tail gun compartment remaining, no left stabilizer, and the nose of the aircraft was completely missing. Surprisingly, he could also see into the plane, the skin of it having been blown off. Inside, he observed terrified young men tending to their wounded, and Stigler just could not shoot the plane down. He had been taught from childhood that honor is everything, and if he survived the war, his father had told him, the only way he would be able to live with himself was if he fought with as much humanity as possible. Stigler could tell that Brown didn't realize how bad the shape his plane was in. He gestured for Brown to land the plane, but Brown had no intention of landing in Germany and being taken prisoner. Stigler then yelled, uh, Sweden, meaning that Brown should land his plane there, but Brown didn't know what he was yelling. Stigler quickly realized that Brown was intent on taking it, making it back to England. And so against all the, all the rules of war, Stigler escorted his enemy safely there, actually protecting him from other attacks and saluting him as he finally turned away and headed back to Germany. For decades afterwards, Brown remained obsessed with this incident. In 1990, he took out an ad in a newsletter for fighter pilots looking for the one who, quote, saved my life on December 20th, 1943. Stigler, now living in Vancouver, saw the ad and yelled to his wife, this is him, this is the one I didn't shoot down. It seems it was likewise the pivotal moment for his life. And Stigler immediately wrote a letter to Brown, and the two men then connected in a very emotional phone call. Stigler and Brown both died in 2008, six months apart. In both of their obituaries, they listed the other, as their very special brother. In the midst of war, God was working family, a family discovered by those who were willing to seek it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. In our deeply broken world, might we take up the work of peace, remembering that what I do matters, that peace begins in my heart, that someone has to do better, and that in Christ I am called into the lives of others. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Would you please stand?